welcome you to worship this morning. Uh, a, a, one housekeeping note, our amp went out at the uh, 9.30 service, which means that those speakers that are over your head ain't working. So, uh, so what you're hearing now are these monitor speakers, which I think are sufficient for what we need, and uh, they probably sound normal to you back there, I'm hoping. Bob, sound normal back there? Yeah. It, it sounds really weird to us up here, because they're kind of reverberating. So just to let you know that's what's going on. If you had trouble hearing today, that would be why, and we apologize. Uh, it's a good day uh, to worship. We are thrilled that you are here, though. Why don't we stand and we will sing our first song together, hymn 608. find the liturgy uh, for the worship service in your bulletin, and we always begin with our apostolic greeting. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. 
And then we do a, a curie and a, a, or a cantico and or a canico. We're going to do a curie and a canico for the next few months. But because we haven't touched anything new in a while, we thought we'd uh, do a, a newer one. And we know that really excites three of you. <laughs> and the rest of you, uh, you you'll enjoy it uh, a few months from now, I promise. And the way we're going to do this is Barb's going to play it once. The, the singers are going to sing it. Why don't you move forward for, so, the, so the mics can grab you. The singers are going to sing it once, and then, um, and, and then you join them. First we do the curé, then the canto. inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, so that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are, we'll go right to our scripture, reading scripture. A reading from the book of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good 
in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. We stand. According to St. Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. Dear good and gracious God, we thank you for the day that you've given us. We pray that you help us to be people of forgiveness, people of love, people of grace. We know 
that there are many times when we've been forgiven, may we share that good gift with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you know me well, you know that I'm a competitive person. I enjoy keeping score. And I come by this honestly because growing up with brothers, that's just what you did. You kept score about just about anything, winning and losing. You, you always knew where you stood, who could have the cleanest plates, who could swing the highest on the swings, who could hit a baseball the furthest, who could be mom's favorite son based on different acts that we did at certain times. I mean, there was always a way for us to tangibly tell who was winning and who was losing. But as I've become an adult, I've realized that relationships don't quite work that way where you're always keeping score. At least they don't work well that way. I've realized that particularly in marriage. I remember the first year that Laura and I were married, uh, I remember trying to keep score with certain things. Like I'd, I'd take the garbage out and I would proudly announce that I was taking the garbage out. I'd make a big deal of it. Laura, I'm taking out the garbage. Like I was like conquering the world or something, taking the garbage out the door and, and 20 feet down the street. And then, you know, put a check in the positive column because I've done my good duty for the day. Obviously, that's a, a wonderful thing. And, and then we'd have dinner, and I'd make some horribly naive comment about how the food wasn't quite as good as mom could cook. I've learned better otherwise now, but, but first year of marriage, 21, really naive. And put that in the negative column, you know, that, that this wasn't quite up to par. And so, so keeping score, and as you can imagine, when you do that, it wasn't wonderful for our relationship. And because you're trying to one-up one another and you're doing things out of obligation and, and it gets off track really quickly. So instead of being in relationship out of love, you're keeping score out of obligation. And Peter, the disciple in the gospel text this morning, likes to keep score. He wants to know exactly how many times he should forgive someone when they do something wrong. And during that time, it was common practice to forgive someone three times. You forgive them three times for doing something wrong. If they do it more than that, you no longer have to forgive them. And so Peter thinks he's got this down. He knows Jesus is a pretty forgiving guy, so if he thinks seven, seven is, is more than twice of what you're normally supposed to forgive someone during this time, I've got it. And of course, Jesus knocks him out of the water because Jesus wants to get out of the numbers game. And so he names a, an incredibly high number of times you should forgive someone. Jesus says 77 times, which is just absurd. But it's Jesus' way to say that this is not about numbers. It's about relationship. And Jesus drives that point home with a parable. He says, there was a servant that owed the king 10,000 talents, and, and one talent alone was 15 years of a laborer's wage. So those of you with the the mathematician minds out there, you would know that's 150,000 years. 150,000 years of wages that he's got to somehow make up. As you know, that's not happening. And so he gets on his knees and begs for forgiveness from the king. And the king doesn't just say that he can pay some of it back here and there or, or that he'll take half his wages for the year. The king completely wipes the debt free. Completely, totally, absolutely. And if the parable ended there, it would be a wonderful story about God's grace that we could never pay back or deserve this wonderful gift that we've been given, that God doesn't keep score. But the parable doesn't end there. It goes a little bit further. The same guy who was forgiven then is owed 100 denarii by another guy. One denarii, one day's work. That's about what it equaled. And so this other guy owed 100 days work essentially. And so you figure this guy had just been forgiven this huge amount, more than he could pay in, a, in, in many lifetimes. Surely he's going to forgive this other gentleman. But as we read, that doesn't happen. The guy in debt begs to be forgiven just as he begged, and he throws him in jail until he's able to pay the debts. And so it seems ridiculous that this guy, who's just been given so much, is unwilling to just give this small amount. But in my more honest moments, I've been there myself. I've been forgiven for something big and, and then turned around myself and not forgiven someone for something a lot smaller in the very next conversation that I have. And I've done that because 
I like keeping score. And denying forgiveness to someone is a, is a huge way of making sure that I'm winning this invisible game. It makes sure that I have the power. And that's the problem. When relationships become about power or winning or ourselves, they ultimately everyone loses. Because forgiveness requires vulnerability. They, they require us to, to not care about wins and losses. Uh, I'm sure I've shared this image before, but it's one that I like when it comes to forgiveness. Donald Miller, uh, the author of Blue Like Jazz, uh, attended Reed College in Oregon. And it's one of the, I think percentage-wise, there's more atheists at Reed College than, than anywhere in the U.S. Uh, and there was this big festival that was going to be taking place that takes place every year, and it's pretty much a big festival uh, for college kids to have a good time, to party, to drink, to get high, all kinds of things along those lines. And they decided that they were going to plop down and they wanted to do something different, this, this small group of Christians and Don Miller being a part of it. And so they decided to set up a confession booth in the center of this festival, and they'd have a sign that would say, confess your sins here. And as you can imagine, on any college campus, what that would look like. But a college campus like this, that's probably not going to go over very well, you would imagine. And so Don Miller is going to be the first one that is going to sit in this booth, and they decide they're going to do something different. They decide that instead of having these people come and confess their sins, the people that are in there are going to confess to the people walking into the booth. Uh, and so the first person comes into the booth, I think Jake was his name, and he says, is this the place where I tell all of the juicy details about everything that I've done this weekend? And Miller paused for a moment and said, no, actually, I'm going to confess to you. So he began, Jesus said to feed the poor and to heal the sick. I've never done much about that. Jesus said to love those who persecute me. I tend to lash out, especially if I feel threatened. He went on and on and on. And finally the person listening said, it's okay, man. And his eyes started to water and then he said, I forgive you. And this went on for hours with People coming in expecting to confess the juicy details of everything that had gone on that weekend, only to find that they were the ones receiving confessions and giving forgiveness. Miller said there was something so powerful about confessing these sins and then hearing them receive forgiveness time and time again. And, and he said there was something powerful not just for him, but he could see it and the people that sat across from him, the way that it affected them, the change on their face. There was something that had broken down between them. These walls that had been up where they entered feeling one way and suddenly with just a few small words, they left feeling completely different. There was a, a chance and an opportunity for a relationship that there was no hope for previously because Miller and this small group of Christians were willing to lose. They didn't care about the score. They cared a lot more about the possibility of relationships and being vulnerable in those relationships. I think the end of this parable often leaves me shaking my head. I'm not quite sure what to do with it. If you remember the rest, the, the king has already forgiven this guy, but then a, a bunch of servants are really disturbed by, by him not giving forgiveness to this other guy who he owed so much less to. And so they run to the king and say, this guy just has completely lost it. He's received this amount of forgiveness and he's not willing to give it out himself. And, and the king is so disturbed that he throws this guy in jail and says he's got to pay his whole debt after all. What do you do with that? It seems like it lessens most of the parable before it. But I think there's one thing that, that helps me move forward through that parable. And I think it's that the, the king is not only describing the condition to of uh, the servant, I think he's describing the condition that he currently lives in, that he's currently living in this prison, that he's unable to get out of something that's keeping him back from being in relationship, that's keeping him back from being the person that God calls him to be. And so he truly is living in this metaphorical prison. I mean, this is a parable after all. These are not meant to necessarily be taken literally. And so we tend to do that as well, I think. When we have difficulty forgiving other people when we have difficulty not keeping score. Uh, I think those are times when we put ourselves in a box and in a prison that, that keeps us from fully realizing who God calls us to be in the midst of relationship. 
And there are certainly people in our lives, I think, that we have trouble forgiving. So I want to be clear that, that I'm not commanding you to forgive this morning. Because I think forgiveness is something that cannot be commanded. But I think we can pray for it. We can pray that we forgive ourselves some of our own regrets and mistakes and hurts. And even the inability to forgive other people. And we can pray that we're able to accept the forgiveness of others when it's extended. And I think above all, we can pray that God keeps bringing us to the space so that we can hear once again God's promise to forgive us and to make us part of a community of love and forgiveness and reconciliation. A community that doesn't keep score. A community that's vulnerable with one another. A community that hears those words of grace time and time again and then goes out into the world and acts upon that. I want to do a couple things uh, this morning. Uh, One of them, uh, I'm going to allow just a couple of minutes, maybe not even that long. I want you to keep in your mind uh, someone that uh, is on your mind that's in need of forgiveness from you, the name of someone, or maybe the name of someone that you need forgiveness from. I'm going to give you a couple moments to spend with that name in your head. If you want to offer up a, a short prayer in your head, you're welcome to do that. If you just want to keep their name on your mind, you're welcome to do that. Barb's going to play softly for just a, just a few moments here. your red hymnal and turn to page 258 in the front, page 258, that person in our mind, I want us to walk through a short confession and forgiveness found on page 258. You're welcome to kneel if you'd like, you're welcome to stay seated as well. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, 
I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we sing our hymn of the day, CLW 758, 785. Dyslexic today. 785, when peace like a river.
gathers the people of God. Let us pray now for the church and the world and for all those who need Christ's love. God of love, we celebrate that we have been bathed in your grace. Let us be people who delight in your forgiveness forever. Lord, in your mercy. <coughs> God of love, give us leaders in our church, in our state, in our schools, in our nations, who are full of compassion and humility, slow to judge and quick to forgive. Lord, in your mercy. <coughs> God of love, mark this place with your grace. Call us to open our arms to not just the least and the lost who we are called to serve, but to those who bully us, <coughs> those who threaten us, those who humiliate us, those who even hurt us. Challenge us to love them, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. God of love, heal us. We pray especially for Keith, for Kimberly, for Ernie, for Harlan, for Meg, for Denise, for Amanda, Roberta, Patty, and Mike, Jean, and Maddie, Marge, Lucinda, Mary, Joyce, and others named aloud now. May they find peace, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. All this we pray, and whatever else your wisdom deems that we may need, we pray in the name of the Savior who has come to us, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share God's love, God's peace.
sing this good song. Merciful God, as grains of wheat scattered upon the hills were gathered together to become one bread, so let your church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. For yours is the glory through Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. and praise. <clears throat> Holy, wonderful, and mysterious God, your love has been showered upon us from the moment of creation, entering our lives in the waters of baptism. You continue to keep your promises to be with us when we call upon your name, as we do in this meal, just as Jesus promised you would when he gathered his disciples in the night in which he was betrayed, taking bread, broke it and gave thanks and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a sign of the new covenant, shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we proclaim the very mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. So come again, Lord, into this space and ignite it with your passion and your love. Come again, Lord, into our place, into our home, into our bodies, filling us with your love. Come again, Lord, into this world, reconciling what is broken and healing us for the kingdom of God is drawing near. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All are welcome at the table that God has set. Amen. You may be seated and we'll commune our assistance first and then bring you forward.
Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. O oh God, the host at every meal, at this table you have spread out a feast for all people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Send us from this banquet to invite others into these good things, to let justice roll down like waters, and to care for the least of our sisters and brothers. Through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign and our Savior. Amen. Uh, the couple things uh, as you're going today, stop and, and look out on the Welcome Center. We're collecting underwear for our um, Joseph's Coat clothing ministry. Uh, new underwear, not even gently used underwear, new underwear. So uh, there's like a wishing well, something you'd see at like a wedding uh, is out there. If, if you want to put some money in that so we can buy underwear at Walmart, or even better yet, when you're out at Walmart or Kroger's or wherever and you pick up a couple packs of underwear, that would be great. Uh, we only do this a couple times a year, and it, it's the only way we can provide uh, this uh, obvious clothing necessity for our, our clients at Joseph's Coat. So we lift that up. There's a large insert or a long insert in your bulletin about Joseph's Coat. We've gone through a transition in our furniture ministry. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, Joseph's Coat Furniture is a... Uh, ministry that Messiah started a number of years ago, but now we do in partnership with a number of other churches in the area. And it's a pretty large ministry in a pretty large warehouse and uh, right on the edge of town here in Reynoldsburg. Uh, anyways, read that. If there's any way you can help out with that furniture ministry that's in transition, that would be, that would be just fantastic. Uh, the other announcement that I've been told of today is that our, our uh, confirmation and youth are meeting today, 5.30 and 7.30. 5.30 and 7.30. Confirmation, 5.30. Youth at 7.30. Do you have any questions? Ask that. Do I get the times right then? Yeah, ask that if you have any questions, because obviously I, I don't know. And um, the, the last piece is that to read that blue bulletin board. Simple as that. Boy, there are just so many ways for you to serve this week. Uh, to be part of the community here, whether it's coming to a meal on Wednesday night. We had almost 200 people here this last Wednesday night for a great meal. Or serving in uh, one of the ways this week at Joseph's Coat or Heart or, or another servant ministry. Um, and I could go on and on, singing, learning, all sorts of things. So get involved, um, grow, uh, become the hands and feet. Why don't you bow your heads for a blessing before we leave. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen. I should acknowledge, too, we didn't do this uh, at 8 o'clock, but um, we don't have Ernie back on the organ yet. Ernie's our organist, been our organist for over 10 years now, I think. Uh, and she had a, uh, she had a, a, a stroke a week ago, and uh, I think she's going to take a couple more weeks off. Barb has filled in uh, for the last two weeks, and we're going to find somebody else to fill in for another couple weeks. But we want to give uh, Barb uh, our appreciation. <laughs> and also, uh, Judy Hodge. Judy was here. Oh, there she is. Judy Hodge has uh, filled in for our chancel choir, too, while Ernie's been down. Uh, but uh, So thanks, Judy, too. And Ernie's well, she just needs to rest for a bit. Let's uh, leave with our last hymn, 789.
Go in peace and serve the Lord.